Chapter Seventeen of The Clue by Carolyn Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seventeen Miss Morton Statements. That afternoon, another session of the inquest was held. Fessenden had told Coroner Benson of Marie's disclosures concerning Miss Morton, and in consequence that lady was the first witness called. The summons was a complete surprise to her. Turning deathly white, she endeavored to answer to her name, but only gave voice to an unintelligible stammer. The coroner spoke gently, realizing that this feminine cloud of witnesses really gave him a great deal of trouble. "'Please tell us, Miss Morton,' he said. "'What was your errand when you left the library and went upstairs, remaining there nearly half an hour, on the night of Miss Van Norman's death?' "'I didn't do any such thing,' snapped Miss Morton, and though her tone was defiant now, her expression still showed fear and dismay. "'You must have forgotten. Think a moment.' You were seen to leave the library, and you were also seen after you reached the upper floors. So try to recollect clearly, and state your errand upstairs at that time. I, I was overcome at the tragedy of the occasion, and I went to my own room to be alone for a time. Did you go directly from the library to your own room? Yes without stopping in any other room on the way yes think again please perhaps i had better tell you a witness has already told of your stopping on the way to your own room she told falsely then i went straight to my bedroom in the third story yes coroner benson was a patient man he had no wish to confound Miss Morton with Marie's evidence, and, too, there was a chance that Marie had not told the truth. So he spoke again persuasively. "'You went there afterward, but first you stopped for a moment or two in Miss Van Norman's sitting-room. "'Who says I did?' "'An eyewitness who chanced to see you.' "'Chance to see me, indeed!' nothing of the sort it was that little french minx marie who is everlastingly spying about well she is not to be believed i am sorry to doubt your own statement miss morton but another member of the household also saw you denial is useless it would be better for you to tell us simply why you went to miss van norman's room at that time "'It's nobody's business,' snapped Miss Morton. "'My errand there had nothing to do in any way with Madeline Van Norman, dead or alive.' "'Then there is no reason you should not tell frankly what that errand was.' "'I have my own reasons, and I refuse to tell.' Mr. Benson changed his tactics. "'Miss Morton,' he said, when did you first know that you were to inherit this house and also a considerable sum of money at the death of miss van norman the effect of this sudden question was startling miss morton seemed to be taken off her guard she turned red then paled to a sickly white once or twice she essayed to speak but hesitated and did not do so come come said the coroner that cannot be a difficult question to answer. When was your first intimation that you were a beneficiary by the terms of Miss Van Norman's will? And now Miss Morton had recovered her bravado. When the will was read, she said in cold, firm accents. No, you knew it before that. You learned it when you went to Miss Van Norman's room and read some papers which were in her desk. You read from a small private memorandum book that she had bequeathed this place to you at her death. "'Nothing of the sort,' returned the quick, snappy voice. "'I knew it before that.' 
and you just said you learned of it first when the will was read. Well, I forgot. Madeline told me the day I came here last year that she had made a will leaving the house to me because she thought it should have been mine anyway. The day you were here last year she told you this? Yes, we had a little conversation on the subject, and she told me. Why did you not say this when I first asked you concerning the matter? I forgot it. Miss Morton spoke nonchalantly, as if contradicting oneself was a matter of no moment. Then you knew of your legacy before Miss Van Norman died? Yes, now that I think of it, I believe I did. She was certainly a difficult witness. She seemed unable to look upon the question as important, and her answers were given either in a flippant or savage manner. Then why did you go to Miss Van Norman's room to look for her will that night? Her will? I didn't. No, not the will that bequeathed you the house, but a later will that made a different disposal of it. There wasn't such a one, said Miss Morton in a low, scared voice. What, then, was the paper which you took from Miss Van Norman's desk, carried to your own room, and burned? The coroner's voice was not persuasive now. It was accusing, and his face was stern as he awaited her reply. Again Miss Morton's face blanched to white. Her thin lips formed a straight line, and her eyes fell, but her voice was strong and sibilant as she fairly hissed, "'How dare you! Of what do you accuse me?' "'Of burning a paper which you took secretly from Miss Van Norman's private desk.' A moment's hesitation, and then, "'I did not do it,' she said clearly." But you were seen to do it. By whom? By a disinterested and credible witness. By a sly spying French servant. It matters not by whom you are asked to explain the act of burning that paper. I have nothing to explain. I deny it. And try as he would, Mr. Benson could not prevail upon Miss Morton to admit that she had burned a paper. He confronted her with the witness, Marie, but Miss Morton coldly refused to listen to her or to pay any attention to what she said. She insisted that Marie was not speaking the truth, and as the matter rested between the two there was nothing more to be done. Kitty French said that she saw Miss Morton go into Madeline's room and afterward go upstairs to her own room, but she knew nothing about the papers in question. Still adhering to her denial of Marie's story, Miss Morton was excused from the witness stand. Another witness called was Dorothy Burt. Fessenden was sorry that this had to be, for he dreaded to have the fact of Carleton's infatuation for this girl brought into public notice. Miss Burt was a model witness, as to her manner and demeanor. She answered promptly and clearly all the coroner's questions, and at first Rob thought that perhaps she was, after all, the innocent child that Carleton thought her. But he couldn't help realizing, as the cross-questioning went on, that Miss Burt really gave very little information of any value, perhaps because she had none to give, perhaps because she chose to withhold it. "'Your name?' Mr. Benson had first asked. "'Dorothy Burt,' was the answer, and the modest voice, with a touch of sadness as befitting the occasion, seemed to have just the right ring to it. "'Your occupation?' I am companion and social secretary to Mrs. Carleton. Do you know of anything that can throw any light on any part of the mystery surrounding the death of Miss Van Norman? 
Miss Burt drew her pretty eyebrows slightly together and thought a moment. No, she said quietly, I am sure I do not. So gentle and sweet was she that many a questioner would have dismissed her then and there, but Mr. Benson, hoping to get at least a shred of evidence bearing on Schuyler Carleton's strange behavior, continued to question her. "'Tell us, please, Miss Burt, what you know of Mr. Carleton's actions on the night of Miss Van Norman's death.' "'Mr. Carleton's actions?' The delicate eyebrows lifted, as if in perplexity at the question. "'Yes, detail his actions, so far as you know them, from the time he came home to dinner that evening. Why, let me see. Pretty Dorothy looked thoughtful again. He came to dinner as usual. Mr. Fessenden was there, but no other guest. After dinner we all sat in the music room. I played a little, just some snatches of certain music that Mrs. Carlton is fond of. Mr. Carlton and Mr. Fessenden chatted together. Rob raised his own eyebrows a trifle at this. Carlton had not been at all chatty. Indeed, Fessenden and Mrs. Carlton had sustained the burden of the conversation. And while Miss Burt had played, it had been bits of romantic music that Rob felt sure had been for Schuyler's delectation more than his mother's. "'Is that all?' said Mr. Benson. "'Yes, I think so,' said Miss Burt. "'We all went to our rooms early, as the next day was the day appointed for Mr. Carlton's wedding, and we assumed he wanted to be alone.' Rob looked up, astounded. Was she going to make no mention of the stroll in the rose garden? He almost hoped she wouldn't, and yet that was certainly the evidence Mr. Benson was after. "'You said good night to Mr. Carlton at what time, then?' was the next rather peculiar question. It might have been imagination, but Fessenden thought the girl was going to name an earlier hour. Then, catching sight of Rob's steady eyes upon her, she hesitated an instant and then said, "'About ten o'clock, I think.' "'Mrs. Carlton and Mr. Fessenden went to their rooms at the same time?' Dorothy Burt turned very pale. She shot a quick glance at Schuyler Carleton and another at Fessenden, and then said in a low tone, "'They had gone upstairs a short time before.' "'And you remained downstairs for a time with Mr. Carleton?' "'Yes.' The answer, merely a whisper, seemed forced upon her lips. "'Where were you?' Again the hesitation, again the swift glances at Carlton and Rob, and then the low answer, "'In the Rose Garden.' Fessenden understood. The girl had no desire to tell these things, but she knew that he knew the truth, and so she was too clever to lie uselessly. "'How long were you two in the Rose Garden, Miss Burt?' Another pause. Somehow Fessenden seemed to see the workings of the girl's mind. If she designated a long time, it would seem important. If too short a time, Rob would know of her inaccuracy. And if she said she didn't know, it would lend a meaning to the Rose Garden interview, which it were better to avoid. "'Perhaps a half-hour,' she said at last, and though outwardly calm, her quick-drawn breath and shining eyes betokened a suppressed excitement of some sort. "'And you left Mr. Carlton at ten o'clock?' "'Yes.' "'Do you know what he did after that?' "'I do not.' The answer rang out clearly, as if Miss Burt were glad to be well past the danger point of the dialogue but it came back at her with the next question. "'What was the tenor of your conversation with Mr. Carlton in the Rose Garden?' At this Dorothy Burt's calm gave way. She trembled, 
her red lower lip quivered, and her eyelids fluttered, almost as if she were about to faint. But, by a quick gesture, she straightened herself up, and looking her interlocutor in the eyes, said, I trust I am not obliged to answer that very personal question. Like a flash it came to Fessenden that her perturbation had been merely a clever piece of acting. She had trembled and seemed greatly distressed in order that Mr. Benson's sympathy might be so aroused that he would not press the question. And indeed, it required a hardened heart to insist on an answer from the lovely agitated girl. But Mr. Benson was not so susceptible as some younger men, and, moreover, he was experienced in the way of witnesses. "'I am sorry to be so personal, Miss Burt,' he said firmly. "'But I fear it is necessary for us to learn the purport of your talk with Mr. Carleton at that time.' Dorothy Burt looked straight at Schuyler Carleton. Neither gave what might be called a gesture, and yet a message and a response flashed between the two. Rob Fessenden, watching intently, translated it to mean a simple negative on Schuyler's part, but the question in the girl's eyes he could not read. Carlton's no, however, was plain as if spoken, and, apparently comprehending, Miss Burt went evenly on. "'We talked,' she said, "'on such subjects as might be expected on the eve of a man's wedding day.' We discussed the probability of pleasant weather. Mention was made of Miss Van Norman and her magnificent personality. The loneliness of Mrs. Carleton's after her son's departure was touched upon, and, while I cannot remember definitely, I think our whole talk was on those or kindred topics. Why did you so hesitate a moment ago when I asked you to tell this? Dorothy opened her lovely eyes in surprise. "'Hesitate? Why, I didn't. Why should I?' Mr. Benson was at last put to rout. She had hesitated, more than hesitated. She had been distinctly averse to relating what she now detailed as a most indifferent conversation, but in the face of that expression of injured innocence Mr. Benson could say no more on that subject. "'When you left Mr. Carleton,' he went on, "'did you know he was about to come over here to Miss Van Norman's?' Again the telegraphic signals between Miss Burt and Carleton. Quick as a flash, invisible to most of the onlookers, but distinctly seen by Fessenden, a question was asked and answered. "'No,' she said quickly, I did not. You left him at ten o'clock then, and did not see him again that night? That is correct. And you have no idea how he was occupied from ten o'clock on? I have not. That's all at present, Miss Burt. The girl left the witness stand, looking greatly troubled but the suspicious Mr. Fessenden firmly believed she looked troubled because it made her more prettily pathetic. He wasn't entirely right in this, but neither was Dorothy Burt quite as ingenuous as she appeared. End of chapter 17「Chapter eighteen of the Clue by Carolyn Wells this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 18 Carlton is Frank Nearly a week had passed. The funeral of Madeline Van Norman had been such as befitted the last of the name, and she had been reverently laid away to rest in the old family vault. But the mystery of her death was not yet cleared up. The coroner's inquest had been finished, but most of the evidence, though vaguely indicative, had been far from conclusive. No further witnesses had been found, 
and no further important fact had been discovered. Schuyler Carleton maintained the same inscrutable air, and though often nervous to the verge of collapse, had reiterated his original story over and over again without deviation. He still refused to state his errand to the Van Norman house on the night of Madeline's death. He still declined to say what he was doing between the time he entered the house and the time when he cried out for help. He himself asserted there was little, if any, time therein unaccounted for. Tom Willard, of course, repeated his story, and it was publicly corroborated by witnesses from the hotel. Tom had changed some during these few days. The sudden accession of a large fortune seemed to burden him rather than to bring him joy. But no one wondered at this when they remembered the sad circumstances which gave him his wealth, and remembered, too, what was no secret to anybody, that he had deeply loved his cousin Madeline. Of the other witnesses, Cicely Dupuy was the only one whose later evidence was not entirely in accordance with her earlier statements. She often contradicted herself and when in the witness chair was subject to sudden fainting attacks. Whether real or assumed, no one was quite sure. And so, after the most exhaustive inquiry and the most diligent sifting of evidence, the jury could return only the time-worn verdict, death at the hands of some person or persons unknown. But in addition to this, it was recommended by the jury that Schuyler Carleton be kept under surveillance. There had not been enough evidence to warrant his arrest, but the district attorney was so convinced of the man's guilt that he felt sure proofs of it would sooner or later be brought to light. Carleton himself seemed apathetic in the matter. He quite realized that his guilt was strongly suspected by most of the community, but instead of breaking down under this, he seemed rather to accept it sadly and without dispute. But though the inquest itself was over, vigorous investigation was going on. A detective of some reputation had the case in hand officially, and unlike many celebrated detectives, he was quite willing to confer with or to be advised by young Fessenden. Spurred by the courtesy and confidence of his superior, Rob devoted himself with energy to the work of unraveling the mystery, but it was baffling work. As he confessed to Kitty French, who was in all things his confidant, every avenue of argument led up against a blank wall. "'Either Carlton did do or he did not,' he said reflectively. If he did, there's absolutely no way we can prove it. And if he didn't, who did? Kitty agreed that this was a baffling situation. What about that cashew, or whatever you call it? she said. It didn't amount to anything as a clue, returned Rob moodily. I showed it to some of the servants, and they said they had never seen such a thing before. Harris was quite sure that none of the men who came here ever used them. I asked Carlton, just casually, for one the other day, and he said he didn't have any, and never had had any. I asked Willard for one at another time, and he said the same thing. It must have been dropped by some of the decorator's men. They seemed a Frenchy crowd and I've been told the French are addicted to these things. Rob took the tiny silver sphere from his pocket and looked at it as he talked. Besides, it wouldn't mean a thing if it had belonged to anybody. I just picked it up because it was the only thing I could find in the drawing room that wasn't too heavy to lift. Rob put his useless clue back into his pocket with a sigh. I'm going to give it up he said, and go back to New York. I've stayed here in Mapleton over a week now, hoping I could be of some help to poor old Carleton. But I can't, 
and yet I know he's innocent. Fairbanks, the detective on the case, is pleasant to work with, and I like him. But if he can't find out anything, of course I needn't hope to. I'd stay on, though, if I thought Carlton cared to have me. But I'm not sure he does, so I'm going back home. When are you going to New York, Kitty? But the girl did not answer his question. Rob, she said, for the intimacy between these two young people had reached the stage of first names, I have an inspiration. I wish I had some faith in it, my dear girl, but your inspirations have such an inevitable way of leading up a tree. I know it, and this may also. But listen, doesn't Schuyler believe that you suspect him? I don't suspect him, declared Rob, almost fiercely. I know you don't, but doesn't Schuyler think you do? Why, I don't know. I never thought about it. I think very likely he does. And he's so proud. Of course, he won't discuss it with you or justify himself in any way. Now, look here, Rob. You go to Schuyler, and in your nicest, friendliest way, tell him you don't believe he did it. Then, don't you see? If he is innocent, he will expand and confide in you, and you may get a whole lot of useful information. And on the other hand, if he is guilty, you'll probably learn the fact from his manner. Rob thought it over. Kitty, he said at last, you're a trump. I believe you have hit upon the only thing there is to try, and I'll try it before I decide to go to New York. I'll stay in Mapleton a day or two longer. For the more I think about it, the more I think I haven't been fair or just to the old boy in not even asking for his confidence. It isn't that so much, but you must assure him of your belief in him. Tell him you know he is innocent. I do know it. Yes, I know that has been your firm conviction all along, though it isn't mine. But don't tell him it isn't mine. Just tell him of your own confidence and sympathy and faith in him and see what happens. A woman's intuitions are always ahead of a man's, declared Rob heartily. I'll do just as you say, Kitty, and I'll do it wholeheartedly, and to the best of my ability. Kitty was still staying in the Van Norman house, which had not yet been, and probably would not soon be, known by any other name. Mrs. Markham had gone away temporarily, though it was believed that when she returned it would be merely to arrange for her permanent departure. The good lady had received a generous bequest in Madeline's will, and except for the severing of old associations, she had no desire to remain in a house no longer the home of the Van Normans. Miss Morton was therefore mistress of the establishment, and thoroughly did she enjoy her position. She invited Miss French to remain for a time as her visitor, and Kitty had stayed on, in hope of learning the truth about the tragedy. At Miss Morton's invitation, Tom Willard had left the hotel and returned to his old room, which he had given up to Miss Morton herself at Madeline's request. Willard, without doubt, sorrowed deeply for his beautiful cousin, but he was a man who rarely gave voice to his grief, and his feelings were evident more from his manner than his words. He seemed preoccupied and absent-minded, and quite unlike Miss Morton, he was in no haste to take even preliminary steps toward the actual acquisition of his fortune. Fessenden was curious to know whether Willard suspected that his cousin's death was the work of Schuyler Carleton, but when he tried to sound Tom on the subject he was met by a rebuff. It was politely worded, but it was nevertheless a plain-spoken rebuff, and conclusively forbade further discussion of the subject. And so as an outcome of Kitty's suggestion, 
Fessenden determined to have a plain talk with Schuyler Carleton. "'Old man,' he said the first time opportunity found him alone with Schuyler in the Carleton library, "'I want to offer you my help. I know that sounds presumptuous, but we're old friends, Carleton, and I think I may be allowed a little presumption on that score. And first, though it seems to me absurdly unnecessary, I want to assure you of my belief in your own innocence. Shuh, belief is a weak word. I know, I am positive that you no more killed that girl than I did. The light that broke over Carlton's countenance was a fine vindication of Kitty's theory. The weary, drawn look disappeared from his face, and impulsively, grasping Rob's hand, he exclaimed, "'Do you mean that?' "'Of course I mean it. I never for an instant thought it possible. You're not that sort of a man.' "'Not that sort of a man.' Carlton spoke musingly. "'That isn't the point, Fessenden. I've thought this thing out pretty thoroughly, and I must say I don't wonder that they suspect me of the deed. You see, it's a case of exclusive opportunity.' "'That phrase always makes me tired,' declared Rob. "'If there's one thing more misleading than circumstantial evidence, it is exclusive opportunity. Now, look here, Carlton. If you'll let me, I'm going to take up this matter. Should you be arrested and tried, and I may as well tell you frankly I'm pretty sure that you will be, I want to act as your lawyer. But in the meantime, I want to endeavor to track down the real murderer and so leave no occasion for your trial." Schuyler Carleton looked like a condemned man who had just been granted a reprieve. "'Do you know, Fessenden,' he said, "'you're the only one who does believe me innocent?' "'Nonsense, man. Nobody believes you guilty.' "'They're so strongly suspicious that it's little short of belief,' said Carleton sadly. "'And truly, Rob, I can't blame them.' Everything is against me. I admit there are some things that must be explained away, and, Schuyler, if I am to be your lawyer, or rather, since I am your lawyer, I must ask you to be perfectly frank with me. Carlton looked troubled. He was not of a frank nature, and it was always difficult for him to confide his personal affairs to anybody. Fessenden saw this and resolved upon strong measures. "'You must tell me everything,' he said somewhat sternly. "'You must do this at the sacrifice of your own wishes. You must ignore yourself and lay your whole heart bare to me, for the sake of your mother and for the sake of the woman you love.' Schuyler Carleton started as if he had been physically struck. "'What do you mean?' he cried. "'You know what I mean,' said Fessenden, gently. "'You did not love the woman you were about to marry. You do love another. Can you deny it?' "'No,' said Carlton, settling back into his apathy. "'And since you know that, I may as well tell you all. I admired and respected Madeline Van Norman.' and when I asked her to marry me, I thought I loved her. After that I met someone else. You know this? Yes, Miss Burt. Yes, she came into this house as my mother's companion, and almost from the first time I saw her I knew that she and not Madeline was the one woman in the world for me. But Fessenden, Never by word or look did I betray this to Miss Burt while Madeline lived. If she guessed it, it was only because of her woman's intuition. I was always loyal to Madeline in word and deed, if I could not be in thought. Was it not your duty to tell Madeline this? I tried several times to do so, 
but though I hate to sound egotistical, she loved me very deeply, and I felt that honor bound me to her. I'm not here to preach to you, and that part of it is, of course, not my affair. I know your nature, and I know that you were as loyal to Miss Van Norman as you would have been had your eyes never seen Miss Burt, and I honor and respect you for it. But you were jealous of Willard? My nature is insanely jealous, yes. And though he was her cousin, I knew Willard was desperately in love with her, and somehow it always made me frantic to see him showing affection toward the woman I meant to make my wife. She was not in love with Willard? Not in the least. Madeline's heart beat only for me, ungrateful wretch that I am. Her little feints at flirting with Willard were only to pique me. I knew this, and yet to see them together always roused that demon of jealousy which I cannot control. Fessenden, aside from all else, how can people think I killed the woman who loved me as she did? Of course that argument appeals to you, and of course it does to me. But you must see how others, not appreciating all this, and even suspecting or surmising that your heart was not entirely with your intended bride, you must see that some appearances, at least, are against you. I do see, and I see it so plainly that even to me those appearances seem conclusive of my guilt. Never mind what they seem to you, old man. They don't seem so to me. And now I'm going to get to work. First, as I told you, you are going to be frank with me. What were you doing in the Van Norman house before you went into the library? Schuyler Carleton blushed. It was not the shame of a guilty man, but the embarrassment of one detected in some betrayal of sentiment. Of course, I will tell you, he said after a moment. I went there on an errand which I wished to keep entirely secret. There is a foolish superstition in our family that has been observed for many generations. An old reliquary which was blessed by some ancient pope has been handed down from father to son for many generations. The superstition is that unless this ancient trinket hangs over the head of a bridegroom on his wedding day, ill fortune will follow him through life. It is part of the superstition that the reliquary must be put in place secretly, and especially without the knowledge of the bride, else its charm is broken. The whole notion is foolishness, but as my wedding was an ill-starred one anyway, I hope to gain happiness, if possible, by this means. Of course, I don't think I really had any faith in the thing but it is such an old tradition in the family that it never occurred to me not to follow it. My mother gave me the reliquary after my father's death, telling me the history of it. I had it with me when I was at the house in the afternoon, and I hoped to find an opportunity to fasten it up in that floral bower, unobserved. But the workmen were busy there when I came away, and I knew there would be many people about the next morning, so I decided to return late at night to do my errand. I had no thought of seeing Madeline. There were no bright lights in the house, and the drawing-room itself was dark, save for what light came in from the hall. I did go into the house, I suppose, at about quarter after eleven. I didn't note the time, but I dare say Mr. Hunt was correct. Without glancing toward the library then, I went at once to the drawing-room and hid the reliquary among the garlands that formed the top of that bower. As I stood there, I thought over what I was about to do the next day. It seemed to me that I was doing right, and I vowed to myself to be a true and loving husband to my chosen wife. I stood there some time, thinking, 
and then turned to go away. As I left the room, I noticed a low light in the library, and it occurred to me that if anyone should be in there, it would be wiser to make my presence known. So I crossed the hall and went into the library. The rest you know. The sudden shock of seeing Madeline as she was, just as I had come from what was to have been our bridal bower, nearly unhinged my mind. I picked up the dagger. I turned on lights and rang bells, not knowing what I did. Now I have told you the truth, and if my demeanor has seemed strange, can you wonder at it in a man who experienced what I did, and then is suspected of being the criminal? Indeed, no, said Fessenden, grasping his friend's hand in sincere sympathy. It was a terrible experience, and the injustice of the suspicion resting on you makes it a hundredfold more horrible. When I went back to the house next morning, I watched for an opportunity, and managed, unobserved, to remove the reliquary from its floral hiding place. I shall never use it now. There are some men fated not to know happiness, and I am one of those. Let us hope not, said Fessenden gently. But whatever the future may hold, let us now keep to the business at hand, and use every possible means to discover the evildoer. End of chapter 18Chapter Nineteen of the Clue by Carolyn Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nineteen, The Truth About Miss Burt. Confidential relations thus being established between the two men, Fessenden wished very much to learn a little more concerning Dorothy Burt, but found it a difficult subject to introduce. It was, therefore, greatly to his satisfaction when Carlton himself led up to it. "'I've been frank with you, Rob,' he said. "'But perhaps there's one more thing I ought to confess.' "'Nonsense, man. I'm not your father, confessor. If you've any facts, hand them over, but don't feel that you must justify yourself to me.' "'But I do want to tell you this.' for it will help you to understand my sensitiveness to the whole matter. As you know, Rob, I do love Dorothy Burt, and it is only since Madeline's death that I have allowed myself to realize how much I love her. I shall never ask her to marry me, for the stigma of this dreadful affair will always remain attached to my name, and suspicion would more than ever turn to me if I showed my regard for Dorothy. As I told you, I never spoke a word of love to her while Madeline was alive. But she knew. She couldn't help knowing. Brave little girl that she is, she never evinced that knowledge, and it was only when I surprised a sudden look in her eyes that I suspected she too cared for me. And yet, though we never admitted it to each other, Madeline suspected the truth and even taxed me with it. Of course I denied it. Of course I vowed to Madeline that she, and she only, was the woman I loved, because I thought it the right and honorable thing to do. If she hadn't cared so much for me herself, I might have asked her to release me, but I never did, and never even thought of doing so, until that last evening. Then, well, you know how she had favored Willard in preference to me in the afternoon, and, though I well knew it was only to tease me, yet it did tease me, and I came home really angry at her. It was an ill-advised occasion for her to favor her cousin. I agree with you, but from the little I know of Miss Van Norman's nature, I judge she was easily piqued and quick to retaliate. Yes, she was. We were both too quick to take offense. 
but of course the real reason for that was the lack of true faith between us well then i came home angered as i said and dorothy was so so different from madeline so altogether sweet and dear so free from petty bickering or sarcasm that for the first time i felt as if i ought not to marry the woman i did not love i brooded over this thought all through the dinner hour and the early evening then you and mother left us and i asked dorothy to go for a little stroll in the garden she refused at first I think the child was a little fearful of what I might say, but I said nothing of the tumult in my heart. I realized, though, that she knew I loved her, and that she cared for me. I had thought she did, but never before had I felt so sure of it, and the knowledge completely unmanned me. I bade her good night abruptly, and rather coldly, and then I went into the library and fought it out with myself, and I concluded that my duty was to Madeline. I confessed to a frantic desire to go to her and ask her, even at that last minute, to free me from my troth, and then I thought what a scandal it would create, and I knew that even if Dorothy and I both suffered, it was Madeline's right to leave matters as they were. Having decided, I proceeded to carry out my earlier intention of going over to the Van Norman house with the reliquary. It was so late then that I had no thought of seeing Madeline, but, and this, Rob, is my confession, on the way there I still had a lingering thought that if I should see Madeline I would tell her the truth and leave it to her generosity to set me free and it was this guilty knowledge, this shameful weakness on my part, that added to my dismay and horror at finding her, as she was, in the library. I read that awful paper. I thought, of course, then, she had taken her own life, and I feared it was because she knew of my falseness and treachery. This made me feel as if I were really her murderer quite as much as if I had struck the actual blow. "'Don't take it like that, Schuyler. That's morbid imagination. You acted loyally to Miss Van Norman to the last, and though the whole situation was most unfortunate, you were not really to blame. No man can rule his own heart, and, anyway, it is not for me to comment on that side of the matter.' but since you have spoken thus frankly of miss burt i must ask you how with your slight acquaintance you are so sure she is worthy of your regard our acquaintance isn't so slight rob she has been some time with mother more than six months and we have been good friends from the first and i know her perhaps by love's intuition but i know her very soul and she is the truest, sweetest nature God ever made. But forgive me, she has impressed me as being not quite so frank and ingenuous as she appears. That's only because you don't know her, and you judge by your own uncertain and mistaken impressions. But when she gave her evidence at the inquest, she seemed to hesitate and to waver as to what she should say. It did not have the right ring of truth, though her manner was charming and even naive. You misjudge her, Rob. I say this because I know it. And I can't blame you, for, knowing of my engagement to Madeline, you are quite right to disapprove of my interest in another woman. It isn't disapproval, exactly. Well, it isn't suspicion, is it? You don't think that Dorothy had any hand in the tragedy, do you? Carlton spoke savagely, with an abrupt change from his former manner, and as he heard his friend's words, Rob knew that he himself had no more suspicion of Dorothy Burt than he had of Carlton. She had testified in a constrained, uncertain manner, but that was not enough to rouse suspicion of her in any way. 
"'Of course not,' Fessenden declared heartily. "'Don't be absurd. But have I your permission to put a few questions to Miss Burt, not in your presence?' "'Of course you have. I trust you to be kind and gentle with her, for she is a sensitive little thing. But I know whatever you may say to her, or she to you, will only make you see more clearly what a dear girl she is. Fessenden was far from sure of this, but having gained Carlton's permission to interview Miss Burt, he said no more about her just then. For a long time the two men discussed the situation, but the more they talked, the less they seemed able to find any plausible theory of the crime. At last Fessenden said, there is one thing certain. If we are to believe Harris's statement about the locks and bolts, no one could have entered from the outside. No, said Carlton, and so we're forced to turn our attention to someone inside the house. But each one in turn seems so utterly impossible. We cannot even suggest Mrs. Markham or Miss Morton. I don't altogether like that Miss Morton. She acted queerly from the beginning. Not exactly queerly. She is not a woman of good breeding or good taste, but she only arrived that afternoon, and it's too absurd to picture her stabbing her hostess that night. I don't care how absurd it is. She profited by Miss Van Norman's death and she was certainly avid to come into her inheritance at once. "'Yes, I know,' said Schuyler, almost impatiently. "'But I saw Miss Morton when she first came downstairs, and though she was shocked, she really did nobly in controlling herself, and even in directing others what to do. You see, I was there, and I saw them all, and I'm sure that Miss Morton had no more to do with that dreadful deed than I had. Then what about her burning that will as soon as Miss Van Norman was dead? I don't believe it was a will, and in fact I'm not sure she burned anything. Oh, yes, she did. I heard that French maid story when she first told it, and it was impossible to believe that she was making it up. Besides, Miss French saw Miss Morton rummaging in the desk. She is erratic, I think, and perhaps not over-refined. But I'm sure she never could have been the one to do that thing. Why, that woman is frightened at everything. She wouldn't dare commit a crime. She is fearfully timid. Dismissing Miss Morton, then, let us take the others, one by one. I think we may pass over Miss French and Miss Gardner. We have no reason to think of Mr. Hunt in this connection, and this brings us down to the servants. Not quite to the servants, said Carlton, with a peculiar look in his eyes that caught Rob's attention. Not quite to the servants? What do you mean? Carlton said nothing, but with a troubled gaze, he looked intently at Fessenden. "'Sicily!' exclaimed Rob. "'You think that?' "'I think nothing,' said Carlton slowly. "'And as an innocent man who was suspected, I hate to hint a suspicion of anyone who may be equally innocent. But does it not seem to you there are some questions to be answered concerning Miss Dupuy?' Fessenden sat thinking for a long time. Surely these two men were just and even generous, and unwilling to suspect without cause. "'There are points to be explained,' said Rob slowly. "'And, Schuyler, since we are talking frankly, I must ask you this. Do you know that Miss Dupuy is very much in love with you?' "'How absurd!' That cannot be. Why, I've scarcely ever spoken to the girl. That doesn't matter. The fact remains. Now, you know she wrote that paper which stated that she loved S., but he did not love her. 
that initial designated yourself and because of this unfortunate attachment cicely was of course jealous or rather envious of madeline i have had an interview with miss dupuy in which she gave me much more information about herself than she thought she did and one of the facts i discovered from what she didn't say rather than what she did was her hopeless infatuation for you it's difficult to believe this but now that you tell me it is true i can look back to some episodes which seem to indicate it but i cannot think it would lead to such desperate results there's one thing certain when we do find the criminal it will have to be somebody we never would have dreamed of for if there were any probable person we would suspect him already now merely for the sake of argument let us see if cicely did not have exclusive opportunity as well as yourself remember she was the last one who saw miss van norman alive i mean so far as we have had any witness or evidence this fact in itself is always a matter for investigation and granting the fact of two women both in love with you one about to marry you and the other perhaps insanely jealous a weapon at hand no one else astir in the house is there not at least occasion for inquiry carleton looked aghast he took up the story and in a low voice said i can add to that when i came in as hunt has testified cicely was leaning over the banister still fully dressed when i cried out for help fifteen minutes later cicely was the first to run downstairs she asked no questions she did not look toward the library she glared straight at me with an indescribable expression of fear and horror i cannot explain her attitude at that moment but if this dreadful thing we have dared to think of could be true it would perhaps be a reason and then you know she tried to get possession secretly of that slip of paper after it had served its purpose yes and also after you by clever observation had discovered that she wrote it and not madeline their writing is strangely alike yes even i was deceived and i have seen much of madeline's writing fessenden this is an awful thing to hint but do you suppose some of the notes i have had purporting to be from miss van norman could have been written by miss dupuy why not several people have said the secretary often wrote notes purporting to be from the mistress oh yes formal society notes but i don't mean that i mean do you suppose cicely could have written of her own accord even unknown to madeline as if as if you know it were madeline herself writing oh on purpose to deceive you yes on purpose to deceive me it could easily be done i've seen so much of both their penmanship and i never noticed it especially i've always taken it for granted that a purely personal note was written by madeline herself but now i wonder do you mean notes of importance i mean notes that annoyed me notes that voluntarily referred to her going driving or walking with willard when there was no real reason for her referring to it could it be that cicely bah i cannot say it of any woman i see your point and it is more than possible that miss dupuy knowing of the strained relations between you and miss van norman might have done anything she could to widen the breach it would be easy as she wrote so much of the correspondence to do this unnoticed yes that's what i mean often madeline's notes would contain a gratuitous bit of information about her and willard 
and though she frequently teased me when we were together, I was surprised at her writing these things. I feel sure now that sometimes, at least, they were the work of Miss Dupuy. I can't describe it exactly, but that would explain lots of things otherwise mysterious. This is getting beyond us, said Rob with a quick sigh. I think it my duty to report this to the coroner and to Detective Fairbanks, who is officially on the case. I thought I liked detective work, but I don't. It leads one toward two dreadful conclusions. Will you go with me, Carlton? I shall go at once to Mr. Benson. No, I think it would be better for you to go alone. Remember, I am practically an accused man, and my word would be of little weight. Moreover, you are a lawyer, and it is your right and duty to make these things known. But unless forced to do so, I do not wish to testify against Miss Dupuy. Remembering the girl's attitude toward Carlton, Rob could not wonder at this, and he went off alone to the coroner's. End of chapter 19
If Miss Dupuy is innocent, our investigations can do her no harm, and if she knows more than she is told, we may be able to learn something of importance. But she is of such a hysterical nature, it is difficult to hold a satisfactory conversation with her. Perhaps it would be advisable for me to talk to her first, said Rob. I might put her more at her ease than a formidable detective could, and then I could report to you what I learn. Yes, agreed the other. You could choose an expedient time, and being in the same house, Miss French might help you. She could secure an interview for me quite casually, I am sure. And then if I don't succeed, you can insist upon an official session and question her definitely. There are indications, mused Mr. Fairbanks, that accidental leaving of such a paper on the table is a little unlikely. If it were done purposely, it would be far easier to understand. Yes, and granting there is any ground for suspicion, all Miss Dupuy's hysterics and disinclination to answer questions would be explained. Well, I hate to suspect a woman, but we won't call it suspicion. We'll call it simply inquiry. You do what you can to get a friendly interview, and, if necessary, I'll insist on an official one later. Rob Fessenden went straight over to the Van Norman house, eager to tell Kitty French the developments of the afternoon. She was more than willing to revise her opinions, and was honestly glad that Mr. Carleton was practically exonerated. "'Of course, there's nothing official,' said Rob, after he had told his whole story. "'But the burden of suspicion has been lifted from Carleton, wherever it may next be placed.' At first Kitty was disinclined to think Cicely could be implicated. "'She's such a slip of a girl,' she said. "'I don't believe that little blue-eyed, yellow-haired thing could stab anybody.' "'But you mustn't reason that way,' argued Rob. "'Opinions don't count at all. We must try to get at the facts. Now let us go at once and interview Miss Dupuy. Can't we see her in that sitting-room as we did before? And she mustn't be allowed to faint this time. We can't help her fainting, declared Kitty, a little indignantly. You're just as selfish as all other men. Everything must bow to your will. I never pretended to any unmanly degree of unselfishness, said Rob blandly. But we must have this interview at once. Will you go ahead and prepare the way?" For answer Kitty ran upstairs and knocked at the door of what had been Madeline's sitting-room, where Miss Dupuy was usually to be found at this hour of the day. The door was opened by Marie, who replied to Kitty's question with a frightened air. "'Miss Dupuy? She has gone away, on the train, with luggage.' "'Gone?' Why? When did she go? But a half hour since. She went most suddenly. Did she indeed? Does Miss Morton know of this? That I do not know, but I think so. Kitty turned to find Fessenden behind her, and as he had overheard the latter part of the conversation, he came into the room and closed the door. Marie he said to the maid. Tell us your idea of why Miss Dupuy went away. She was in fear, said Marie deliberately. In fear of what? In fear of the detectives and the questions they ask, and the dreadful coroner man. Miss Dupuy is not herself any more. She is so in fear she cannot sleep at night. Always she cries out in her dream. Fessenden glanced at Kitty. "'What does she say, Marie?' he asked. "'Nothing that I can understand, monsieur, but always low cries of fear, and sometimes she murmurs, "'I must go away. I cannot again answer those dreadful questions. I shall betray my secret.' Over and over she mutters that. 
Fessenden began to grow excited. Surely this was evidence, and Cicely's departure seemed to emphasize it. Without another word he went in search of Miss Morton. "'Did you know Miss Dupuy was going away?' he said abruptly to her. "'Yes,' she replied. "'The poor girl is completely worn out. For the last few days she has been looking over Madeline's letters and papers and accounts, and she is really overworked, besides the fearful nervous strain we are all under.' "'Where has she gone?' "'I don't know. I meant to ask her to leave an address, but she said she would write to me as soon as she reached her destination, and I thought no more about it. "'Miss Morton, she has run away. Some evidence has come to light that makes it seem possible she may be implicated in Madeline's death, and her sudden departure points toward her guilt.' "'Guilt?' Miss Dupuy? Oh, impossible. She is a strange and emotional little creature, but she couldn't kill anybody. She isn't that sort. I'm getting a little tired of hearing that this one or that one isn't that sort. Do you suppose anybody in decent society would ever be designated as one who is that sort? Unless the murderer was some outside tramp or burglar, it must have been someone probably not of that sort. But, Miss Morton, we must find Miss Dupuy, and quickly. When did she go? I don't know. Some time ago, I think. I ordered the carriage to take her to the station. Perhaps she hasn't gone yet, from the station, I mean. Rob looked at his watch. Do you know anything about train times? he asked. No, except that there are not very many trains in the afternoon. I don't even know which way she is going. Rob thought quickly. It seemed foolish to try to overtake the girl at the railway station, but it was the only chance. He dashed downstairs, and catching up a cap as he rushed through the hall, he was out on the road in a few seconds and running at a steady, practiced gait toward the railroad. After he had gone a few blocks, he saw a motor car standing in front of a house. He jumped in and said to the astonished chauffeur, "'Whiz me down to the railroad station, and I'll make it all right with your master, and with you, too.' The machine was a doctor's runabout, and the chauffeur knew that the doctor was making a long call, so he was not at all unwilling to obey this impetuous and masterful young man. Away they went, doubtless exceeding the speed limit, and in a short time brought up suddenly at the railroad station. Rob jumped out, flung a bill to the chauffeur, gave him a card to give to his master, and waved a good-bye as the motor-car vanished. He strode into the station, only to be informed by the ticket agent that a train had left for New York about a quarter of an hour since and another would come along in about five minutes, which, though it made no regular stop at Mapleton, could be flagged if desired. A few further questions brought out the information that a young woman corresponding to the description of Miss Dupuy had gone on that train. Fessenden thought quickly. The second train, a fast one, he knew would pass the other at a siding, and if he took it, he would reach New York before Cicely did, and could meet her there when she arrived at the station. Had he had longer to consider, he might have acted differently, but on the impulse of the moment he bought a ticket, said, "'Flag her, please,' and soon he was on the train actually in pursuit of the escaping girl. As he settled himself in his seat, he rather enjoyed the fact that he was doing real detective work now. Surely Mr. Fairbanks would be pleased at his endeavors to secure the interview with Miss Dupuy under such difficulties. But his plan to meet her at the Grand Central Station was frustrated by an unforeseen occurrence. His own train was delayed by a hot box, and he learned that he would not reach New York until after Miss Dupuy had arrived there. 
return from a way station was possible, but Rob didn't want to go back to Mapleton with his errand unaccomplished. He thought it over and decided on a radical course of action. Instead of alighting there himself, he wrote a telegram which he had dispatched from the way station to Miss Kitty French, and which ran, "'Gone to New York. Make M. tell C.'s address and wire me at the Waldorf.' It was a chance, but he took it, and, anyway, it meant only spending the night in New York and returning to Mapleton next day if his plan failed. He had a strong conviction that Marie knew Cicely's address, although she had denied it. If this were true, Kitty could possibly learn it from her and let him know in time to hunt up Cicely in New York. And if Marie really did not know the address, there was no harm done, after all. The excitement of the chase stimulated Rob's mental activity, and he gave rein to his imagination. If Cicely Dupuy were guilty, she would act exactly as she had done, he thought. A calmer, better-balanced woman would have stayed at Mapleton and braved it out, but Miss Dupuy's excitable temperament would not let her sleep or rest, and made it impossible for her to face inquiry discreetly. Rob purposed, if he received the address he hoped for, to go see the girl in New York and by judicious kindliness of demeanor to learn more from her about the case than she would tell under legal pressure. As it turned out, whatever might be his powers of detective acumen, his intuition regarding Marie's information was correct. Kitty French, quickly catching the tenor of the telegram, took Marie aside and commanded her to give up the address. Marie volubly protested and denied her knowledge, but Kitty was firm, and the stronger will conquered. Luckily, Marie at last told, and Kitty went herself to send the telegram. Marie accompanied her, as it was then well after dusk, but Kitty did not permit the girl to enter the telegraph office with her. And so, by ten o'clock that evening, Rob Fessenden received from the hotel clerk a telegram bearing an address in West 66th Street, which not only satisfied his wish, but caused him to feel greatly pleased at his own sagacity. It was too late to go up there that evening, and so the amateur detective was forced to curb his impatience until the next morning. He was afraid the bird might have flown by that time, but there was no help for it. He thought of telephoning, but he didn't know the name of the people Cicely had gone to, and, too, even if he could succeed in getting the call, such a proceeding would only startle her. So he devoted the rest of the evening to writing a letter to Kitty French, ostensibly to thank her for her assistance, but really for the pleasure of writing her. This he posted at midnight thinking that if he should be detained longer than he anticipated, she would then understand why. Next morning the eager young man ate his breakfast and read his paper a bit impatiently while he waited for it to be late enough to start. Soon after nine he called a taxicab and went to the address Kitty had sent him. Only the house number had been told in the message, so when Fessenden found himself in the vestibule of an apartment house, with sixteen names above corresponding bells, he was a bit taken aback. "'I wish I'd started earlier,' he thought, "'for it's a matter of trying them all until I strike the right one.' But he fancied he could deduce something from the names themselves, at least for a start. Eliminating one or two Irish-sounding names, also a smith and a miller, he concluded to try first two names which were doubtless French. The first gave him no success at all, but, undiscouraged, he tried the other. "'I wish to see Miss Dupuis,' he said to the woman who opened the door. "'She is not here,' was the curt answer. 
but the intelligence in the woman's eye at the mention of the name proved to Fessenden that at least this was the place. "'Don't misunderstand,' he said gently. "'I want to see Miss Dupuy merely for a few moments' friendly conversation. It will be for her advantage to see me rather than to refuse.' "'But she is not here,' repeated the woman. "'There is no person of that name in my house.' "'When did she go?' asked Rob quietly, so quietly that the woman was taken off her guard. "'About half an hour ago,' she said, and then, with a horror-stricken look at her own thoughtlessness, she added hastily, "'I mean my friend went. Your Miss Dupuy I do not know.' "'Yes, you do,' said Rob decidedly. And as she has gone, you must tell me at once where she went. The woman refused, and not until after a somewhat stormy scene and some rather severe threats on Fessenden's part did she consent to tell that Cicely had gone to the Grand Central Station. More than this she would not say, and thinking he was wasting valuable time on her, Rob turned, and racing down the stairs, for there was no elevator, he jumped in his cab and whizzed away to the station. End of chapter 20「Chapter 21 of The Clue by Carolyn Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 21: A Successful Pursuit. Before he entered the station he looked through the doorway, and to his delight saw the girl for whom he was looking. He did not rush madly into the station, but paused a moment, and then walked in quietly, thinking that if his quest should be successful he must not frighten the excitable girl. Cicely sat on one end of the benches in the waiting room. In her dainty traveling costume of black, and her small hat with its black veil, she looked so fair and young that Rob felt sudden misgivings as to his errand. But it must be done, and, quietly advancing, he took a seat beside her. "'Where are you going, Miss Dupuy?' he asked in a voice which was kinder and more gentle than he himself realized. She looked up with a start and said in a low voice, "'Why do you follow me?' May I not be left alone to go where I choose? You may, Miss Dupuy, if you will tell me where you are going and give me your word of honor that you will return if sent for. To be put through an examination? No, thank you. I'm going away where I hope I shall never see a detective or a coroner again. Are you afraid of them, Miss Dupuy? The girl gave him a strange glance, but it showed anxiety rather than fear. However, her only reply was a low-spoken, Yes. And why are you afraid? I am afraid I may tell things that I don't want to tell. The girl spoke abstractly and seemed to be thinking aloud rather than addressing her questioner. It may be that Fessenden was influenced by her beauty or by the exquisite femininity of her dainty contour and apparel, but aside from all this he received a sudden impression that what the girl said did not betoken guilt. He could not have explained it to himself, but he was at that moment convinced that though she knew more than she had yet told, Cicely Dupuy was herself innocent. "'Miss Dupuy,' he said very earnestly, won't you look upon me as a friend instead of a foe? I am quite sure you can tell me more than you have told about the Van Norman tragedy. Am I wrong in thinking you are keeping something back? I have nothing to tell, said Cicely, and the stubborn expression returned to her eyes. It did not seem a very appropriate place in which to carry on such a personal conversation but Fessenden thought perhaps the very publicity of the scene might tend to make Miss Dupuy preserve her equanimity better than in a private house. So he went on. 
"'Yes, you have several things to tell me, and I want you to tell me now. The last time I talked to you about this matter, I asked you why you gave false evidence as to the time that Mr. Carleton entered the Van Norman house that evening, and you responded by fainting away. Now you must tell me why that question affected you so seriously.' It didn't. I was nervous and overwrought, and I chanced to faint just then. Fessenden saw that this explanation was untrue, but had been thought up and held ready for this occasion. He saw, too, that the girl held herself well in hand, so he dared to be more definite in his inquiries. "'Do you know, Mr. Puy, that you are seriously incriminating yourself when you give false evidence?' "'I don't care,' was the answer, not flippantly given, but with an earnestness of which the speaker herself seemed unaware. And Fessenden was a good enough reader of character to perceive that she spoke truthfully. The only construction he could put upon this was that, as he couldn't help believing, the girl was innocent and therefore feared no incriminating evidence against her. But in that case, what was she afraid of, and why was she running away? "'Mr. Puy,' he began, starting on a new tack, "'please show more confidence in me. Will you answer me more straightforwardly, if I assure you of my belief in your own innocence? I will not conceal from you the fact that not everyone is so convinced of that as I am, and so I look to you for help to establish it.' "'Establish what? My innocence?' said Cicely, and now she looked bewildered rather than afraid. "'Does anybody think that I killed Miss Van Norman?' "'Without going so far as to say anyone thinks so, I will tell you that they think there are indications that point to such a thing.' "'How absurd!' said Cicely, and the honesty of her tone seemed to verify Fessenden's conviction that whatever guilty knowledge this girl might possess, she herself was innocent of crime. "'If it is an absurd idea, then why not return to Mapleton and answer any queries that may be put to you? You are innocent, therefore you have nothing to fear.' "'I have a great deal to fear.' The girl spoke gently, even sadly, now. She seemed full of anxiety and sorrow that yet showed no trace of apprehension for herself. All at once a light broke upon Fessenden. She was shielding somebody. Nor was it hard to guess who it might be. "'Miss Dupuy,' began Rob again, eagerly this time, "'I have succeeded in establishing, practically, Mr. Carleton's innocence. May I not likewise establish your own?' "'Mr. Carleton's innocence,' repeated the girl, clasping her hands. "'Oh, is that true? Then who did do it?' "'We don't know yet,' went on Rob, hastening to make the most of the advantage he had gained. "'But having assured you that it was not Schuyler Carleton, will you not tell me what it is you have been keeping secret?' "'How do you know Mr. Carleton is innocent?' Have you proved it? Has someone else confessed? No, no one has confessed, and indeed I may as well own up that no one is quite sure of Mr. Carleton's innocence as I am myself. But I am sure of it, and I'm going to prove it. Now, will you not help me to do so? How can I help you? by explaining that discrepancy in time so far as you can. You testified that Mr. Carleton entered the house at half-past eleven, and Mr. Hunt said he came in at quarter-past. What made you tell that falsehood and stick to it? "'Why, nothing,' exclaimed Cicely, "'except that I thought I saw Mr. Carleton come into the house some little time before he cried out for help.' I was looking over the baluster when Mr. Hunt said he saw me, and I, too, thought it was Mr. Carleton who came in then. "'It was Mr. Carleton, 
but he has satisfactorily explained why he came in and what he was doing until the time when he called out for help. Why did you not tell us about this at first? I was afraid, afraid they might connect Mr. Carlton with the murder, and I was afraid... You were afraid that he really had done the deed? Yes, said Cicely, in a very low voice but with an intonation that left no doubt of her truthfulness. "'Then,' said Rob in his kindest way, "'you may set your mind at rest. Mr. Carlton is no longer under actual suspicion, and you may go away, as you intended, for a few days' rest. I should be glad to have your address, though I trust it will not be necessary for me to send for you and I know you will not be called to witness against Schuyler Carleton. Cicely gave the required address, and though they continued the conversation for a short time, Rob concluded that the girl knew nothing that actually bore on the case. Her own false evidence and nervous apprehension had all been because of her anxiety about Mr. Carleton and her fear that he had really been the murderer. Her written paper and all the evidences of her jealousy of Miss Van Norman were the result of her secret and unrequited love for the man, and her attempted flight was only because she feared that her uncontrollable emotion and impulsive utterances might help to incriminate him. Fessenden was truly sorry for her, and glad that she could go away from the trying scenes for a time. He felt sure that she would come, if summoned, for now, relieved of her doubt of Carleton, she had no reason for refusing any testimony she could give. It was in a kindly spirit that he bade her good-bye, and promised to use every effort not only to establish Carleton's innocence, but to discover the guilty one. When Fessenden returned to the Van Norman house, several people were awaiting him in the library. Miss Morton and Kitty French were there, also Coroner Benson and Detective Fairbanks. "'Were you too late?' asked Kitty as Rob entered the room. "'No, not too late. I found Miss Dupuy in the Grand Central Station, and I had a talk with her.' "'Well,' said Kitty impatiently, "'she is as innocent as you or I.' "'How did you find it out so quickly?' inquired Mr. Fairbanks, who had a real liking for the enthusiastic young fellow. "'Why, I found out that she was hanging over the baluster, as Hunt said, and she did see Carlton come in at a quarter after eleven. Then she went back to her room and heard Carlton cry out at half-past eleven, and when she discovered what had happened, she suspected Carlton of the deed.' and endeavoring to shield him, she refused to give evidence that might incriminate him. But, cried Kitty, of course Mr. Carlton didn't do it if Cicely did. But you don't see, Miss French, said the older detective, as Fessenden sat staring in blank surprise at what he deemed Kitty's stupidity. Don't you see that if Miss Dupuy suspected Mr. Carlton, she couldn't by any possibility be guilty herself? "'Why, of course she couldn't,' exclaimed Kitty. "'And I'm truly glad, for I can't help liking that girl, if she is queer. But then who did do it?' Suspicion was again at a standstill. There was no evidence to point anywhere. There were no clues to follow, and no one had any suggestion to offer. It was at this juncture that Tom Willard and Schuyler Carleton came in together. They were told of Fessenden's interview with Miss Dupuy at the station, and Carleton expressed himself as thoroughly glad that the girl was exonerated. He said little, however, for it was a delicate subject, since it all hinged on Miss Dupuy's affection for himself. Tom Willard listened to Fessenden's recital but he only said that nothing would ever have induced him to suspect Miss Dupuy anyway, for it could not have been the deed of a fragile young girl. "'The blow that killed Maddy was powerfully dealt,' said Tom, 
and I can't help thinking it was some tramp or professional burglar who was clever enough to elude Harris's fastenings, or some window may have been overlooked that night. At any rate, we have no more plausible theory. We have not, said Mr. Fairbanks, but I, for one, am not content to let the matter rest here. I should like to suggest that we call in some celebrated detective whose experience and skill would discover what is beyond the powers of Mr. Fessenden and myself. Rob felt flattered that Mr. Fairbanks classed him with himself, and felt anxious, too, that the suggestion of employing a more skillful detective should be carried out. But, objected Coroner Benson, to engage a detective of high standing would entail considerable expense, and I am not sure that I am authorized to sanction this. There was a silence, but nearly everyone in the room was thinking that surely this was the time for Tom Willard to make use of his lately inherited Van Norman money. Nor was Willard delinquent. Though showing no overwillingness in the matter, he said plainly that he would be glad if Coroner Benson or Mr. Fairbanks would engage the services of the best detective they could find and allow him to defray all expenses attendant thereon. At this, a murmur of approval went around the room. All his hearers were at their wit's end what to do next, and the opportunity of putting a really great detective on the case was welcome indeed. "'But I don't believe,' said Willard, "'that he will find out anything more than our own men have discovered.' The appreciative glance Tom gave Mr. Fairbanks and Rob quite soothed whatever touch of jealousy they may have felt of the new detective. It was Carlton who suggested Fleming Stone. He did not know the man personally, but he had read and heard of the wonderful work he had done in celebrated cases all over the country. Of course they had all heard of Fleming Stone, and each felt a thrill of gratitude to Willard whose wealth made it possible to employ the great detective. Mr. Fairbanks wasted no time, but wrote at once to Fleming Stone, and received a reply stating that he would arrive in Mapleton in a few days. But in the meantime Rob Fessenden could not be idle. In truth, he had a secret ambition to solve the mystery himself, before the great detective came and to this end he stayed on in Mapleton, and racked his brain for ideas on the subject. Mr. Fairbanks was more easily discouraged, and, frankly, confessed the case was beyond his powers. Privately he still suspected Mr. Carleton, but in the face of Rob's faith in his friend, and also because of the demeanor of Carleton himself, he couldn't avow his suspicion. For since Fessenden's assertion of confidence, Carlton had changed in his attitude toward the world at large. Still broken and saddened by the tragedy, he did not show that abject and self-condemnatory air which had hung round him during the inquest week. Kitty French had almost recovered faith in him, and had there been anyone else at all to suspect, she would have asserted her belief in his innocence. Carlton himself seemed baffled. His suspicions had been directed toward Sicily, because he could see no other possibility. But the proof of her suspicions of himself, of course, showed he was wrong in the matter. He could suggest nothing. He could think of nobody who might have done the deed, and he was thoroughly content to place the whole affair unreservedly in the hands of Fleming Stone. Indeed, everyone seemed to be glad of the expected help, if we accept Fessenden. He was restlessly eager to do something himself, and saw no reason why he shouldn't keep on trying until Stone came. End of chapter 21 Chapter 22 of The Clue by Carolyn Wells this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 22 A Talk with Miss Morton 
Of course Fessenden confided his wishes to Kitty French. Equally, of course, that obliging young woman was desirous of helping him attain them. But neither of them could think of new lines of investigation to pursue. "'We've no clue but that little cashew,' said Miss French, by way of summing up. "'And as that's no good at all, we have really nothing that can be called a clue.' "'No,' agreed Rob, "'and we have no suspect. Now that Carlton and Miss Dupuy are both out of it, I don't see who could have done it.' "'I never felt fully satisfied about Miss Morton and her burned paper,' said Kitty thoughtfully. They were walking along a village road while carrying on this conversation, so there was no danger of Miss Morton's overhearing them. "'I've never felt satisfied about that woman anyway,' said Rob. "'The oftener I see her, the less I like her. She's too smug and complacent, and yet when she was questioned she went all to pieces.' "'Well, as she flatly contradicted what Marie had said, of course they couldn't keep on questioning her. You can't take a servant's word against a lady's. You ought to, in a serious case like this. I say, Kitty, let's go there now and have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with her. Kitty laughed at the idea of a heart-to-heart -heart talk between those two people, but she said she was willing to go. It mayn't amount to anything, went on Rob and yet it may. I've asked Mr. Fairbanks to chase up that burned paper matter, but he said there was nothing in it. He didn't hear Marie's story, you see. He only heard it retold, and he doesn't know how sincere that girl seemed to be when she told about it. Yes, and I saw Miss Morton in Maddy's room, too. I think she ought to tell what she was up to. So to the Van Norman house went the two inquisitors, and had Miss Morton known of their fell designs, she might not have greeted them as cordially as she did. Miss Morton had grown fond of Kitty French during the girl's stay with her, and she looked with approval on the fast-growing friendship between her and young Fessenden. As the hostess of the Van Norman house, too, Miss Morton showed a kindly hospitality, and though she was without doubt eccentric and sometimes curt of speech, she conducted the household and directed the servants with very little friction or awkwardness. She was most friendly toward Tom Willard and Schuyler Carleton, and the latter often dropped in at the tea hour. Fessenden dropped in at any hour of the day, and of course Mr. Fairbanks came and went as he chose. Fessenden and Kitty found Miss Morton in the library, and, as they had decided beforehand, went straight to the root of the matter. "'Miss Morton,' Fessenden began, "'I want to do a little more questioning on my own account before Mr. Fleming Stone arrives. I'm sure you won't object to helping me out a bit by answering a few queries.' "'Go ahead,' said Miss Morton grimly, but not unkindly. "'They are a bit personal,' went on Rob, who was at a loss how to begin, now that he was really told to do so. "'Well?' This time Miss Morton's tone was more crisp, and Kitty began to see that Rob was on the wrong tack. So she took the helm herself and said with a winning smile, "'We want you to tell us frankly what was the paper you burned.' Something in Miss Morton's expression went to the girl's heart, and she added impulsively, "'I know it wasn't anything that affects the case at all, and if you want to refuse us, you may.' "'I'd rather not tell you,' said Miss Morton, and a faraway look came into her strange eyes. "'But since you have shown confidence in me, I prefer to return it.' She took Kitty's hands in hers, and from the gentle touch the girl was sure that whatever the nature of the coming confidence, it was not that of a guilty conscience. "'As you know, Kitty,' she began, addressing the girl, though she glanced at Rob occasionally, "'many years ago I was betrothed to Richard Van Norman. 
we foolishly allowed a trifling quarrel to separate us for life. I will not tell you the story of that now, although I will sometime, if you care to hear it. But we were both quick-tempered, and the letters that passed between us at that time were full of hot, angry, unconsidered words. They were letters such as no human beings ought to have written to each other. Perhaps it was because of their exceeding bitterness, which we read and reread, that we never made up that quarrel, though neither of us ever loved any one else, or ceased to love the other. At the death of Richard Van Norman, two years or more ago, I burned his letters which I had kept so long, and I wrote to Madeline, asking her to return mine to me if they should be found among her uncle's papers. "'Dear Miss Morton,' said Kitty, "'don't tell us any more if it pains you. We withdraw our request, don't we, Rob?' "'Yes, indeed,' said Fessenden heartily. "'Forgive us, Miss Morton, for what is really an intrusion and an unwarrantable one.' "'I want to tell you a little more,' Miss Morton resumed, "'and afterward I'll tell you why I've told it.' Madeline replied with a most kind letter, saying she had not found the letters, but should she ever do so, she would send them to me. About a year ago, she wrote and asked me to come here to see her. I came, thinking she had found those letters. She had not, but she had found her uncle's diary, which disclosed his feelings toward me, both before and after our quarrel, and she told me then she intended to leave this place to me in her will, because she thought it ought to be mine. Truth to tell, I didn't take much interest in this bequest, for I supposed the girl would long outlive me. But I had really no desire for the house without its master, and though I didn't tell her so, I would rather have had the letters which I hoped she had found than the news of her bequest. "'Why did you want the letters so much, Miss Morton?' asked Kitty. "'Because, my dear, they were a disgrace to me. They would be a disgrace to any woman alive.' You, my child, with your gentle disposition, can't understand what dreadful cruelty an angry woman can be guilty of on paper. Well, again Madeline told me she would give me the letters, if they ever appeared, and I went home. I didn't hear from her again till shortly before her wedding, when she wrote me that the letters had been found in a secret drawer of Richard's old desk. She invited me to come to her wedding, and said that she would then give me the letters. Of course I came, and that afternoon that I arrived she told me they were in her desk, and she would give them to me next morning. I was more than impatient for them. I had waited forty years for them, but I couldn't trouble her on her wedding eve. And then when, when she went away from us, without having given them into my possession, I was so afraid they would fall into other hands that I went in search of them. I found them in her desk, I took them to my room and burned them without reading them. And that is the true story of the burned papers. I did look over a memorandum book, thinking it might tell where they were. But right after that I found the letters themselves in the next compartment, and I took them. They were mine. The dignified complacency with which Miss Morton uttered that last short sentence commanded the respect of her hearers. "'Indeed, they were yours, Miss Morton,' said Fessenden, "'and I'm glad you secured them before other eyes saw them.' Kitty said nothing, but held Miss Morton's hand in a firm, gentle pressure that seemed to seal their friendship. "'But—' said Fessenden, a little diffidently. Why didn't you tell all this at the inquest as frankly as you have told us? Miss Morton paled, and then grew red. I am an idiot about such things, she said. When questioned publicly like that, I am so embarrassed, and also so fearful, that I scarcely know what I say. I try to hide this by a curt manner and a bravado of speech, 
with the result that I get desperate and say anything that comes into my head, whether it's the truth or not. I not only told untruths, but I contradicted myself when witnessing. But I couldn't seem to help it. I lost control of my reasoning powers, and finally I felt my only safety was in denying it all. For, and this was my greatest fear, I thought they might suspect that I killed Madeline, if they knew I did burn the papers. Afterward, I would have confessed that I had testified wrongly, but I couldn't see how it would do any good. No, said Rob slowly, except to exonerate Marie of falsehood. Miss Morton set her lips together tightly and seemed unwilling to pursue that subject. And now, she said, the reason I've told you two young people this is because I want to warn you not to let a quarrel or a foolish misunderstanding of any sort come between you to spoil the happiness that I see is in store for you. Good for you, Miss Morton, cried Rob. You're a brick. You've precipitated matters a little. Kitty and I haven't put it into words as yet, but we accept the preliminary congratulations, don't we, dear? And foolish little Kitty only smiled and buried her face on Miss Morton's shoulder instead of the young man's. And so Miss Morton's name was erased from Rob's list of people to be inquired of, and as he acknowledged to himself, he was quite ready now to turn over his share of the case to Fleming Stone. And, too, since Miss Morton had given a gentle push to the rolling stone of his affair with Kitty, it rolled faster, and the two young people had their heart-to-heart -heart talks with each other instead of adding a third to the interview. But there was just one more unfinished duty that Fessenden determined to attend to. Carlton had assured him that he was at liberty to talk to Dorothy Burt if he chose, and Rob couldn't help thinking that he ought to get all possible light on the case before Mr. Stone came, for he proposed to assist that gentleman greatly by his carefully tabulated statements and his cross-reference columns of evidence. So, unaccompanied by Kitty, who was apt to prove a disturbing influence on his concentration of mind, he interviewed Miss Burt. It was not difficult to get an opportunity, as she rarely left the house, and Mrs. Carleton was not exigent in her demands in her companion's time. So the two strolled in the rose garden late one afternoon, and Rob asked Miss Burt to tell him why she hesitated so when on the witness stand, and why she looked at Carleton with such unmistakable glances of inquiry which he is certainly answered. Dorothy Burt replied to the question as frankly as they were put. "'To explain it to you, Mr. Fessenden,' she said, "'I must first tell you that I loved Mr. Carleton even while Miss Van Norman was his affianced bride. I tell you this simply, both because it is the simple truth and because Mr. Carleton advised me to tell you, if you should ask me. And, knowing this, you may be surprised to learn that when I heard of Miss Van Norman's death, I... She raised her wonderful eyes and looked straight at Rob. I thought she died by Schuyler's hand. Yes, you may well look at me in surprise. I know it was dreadful of me to think he could have done it, but I did think so. You see, I loved him, and I knew he loved me. He had never told me so, had never breathed a word that was disloyal to Miss Van Norman, and yet I knew. And that last evening in this very rose garden, on the night before his wedding, we walked here together, and I knew from what he didn't say, not from what he did say, that it was I whom he loved and not she. He left me with a few cold, curt words that I knew only too well masked his real feelings, and I saw him no more that night. He had told me he was going over to Miss Van Norman's, and so when I heard of the, the tragedy, I couldn't help thinking he had yielded to a sudden terrible impulse. 
Oh, I'm not defending myself for my wrong thought of him. I'm only confessing that I did think that. And how did you learn that you were mistaken, said Rob gently, and that Schuyler didn't do it? Why, the very next night he told me he loved me, said the girl, her face alight with a tender glory. And then I knew. And your embarrassment at the question on the witness stand? Was only because I knew suspicion was directed toward him, and I feared I might say something to strengthen it, even while trying to do the opposite. And you didn't care whether you told the truth or not? If the truth would help to incriminate Schuyler, I would prefer not to tell it. The gentle sadness in Dorothy's tone robbed this speech of the jarring note it would otherwise have held. "'You are right, Miss Burt,' said Rob, "'and I thank you for the frank confidence you have shown in talking to me as freely as you have done.' "'Schuyler told me to,' said the girl simply. End of chapter 22